March 13th, 1997, this event called Lights Over Phoenix, what did you see? Well, I saw a, uh, a huge craft just kind of come right over Squaw Peak um, that was, you know, it was just breathtaking. And um, I, I'm not sure about the, the date, you've, you've got a better memory March for the 13th. dates than I do. Yeah. But there was no, like the Clinton day, no? No. <laughs> No, I was on a strict diet. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious now. That that it was a it was a U, unquestionably it was a UFO, which means unidentified flying object. Right. Doesn't nothing, mean we're being visited. Well, it's nothing like anything I've ever seen. And, and you're an Air Force guy. Yeah, yeah, and a pilot. Uh, got a lot of hours flying, so uh, it was pretty breathtaking. Something happened in the skies over Arizona the night of March 13th. No one is sure what it was, but thousands saw it, dozens videotaped it, and people all over the state are haunted by it still. Those were the words of Richard Price in a USA Today article published on Wednesday, June 18th, 1997. Three months had passed since the events that are now collectively referred to as the Phoenix Lights or the Lights Over Arizona, and Arizona residents were still trying to make sense of what they'd seen. The Phoenix Lights were a series of widely sighted, unidentified flying objects observed in the skies over the U.S. state of Arizona and ranging onward to Nevada and even the Mexican state of Sonora. On March 13, 1997, lights of varying descriptions were seen by thousands of people between 7.30 and 10.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, covering an area of around 300 miles, or 480 kilometers. This event spanned from the Nevada line, across Phoenix, and to the edge of Tucson. When we talk about the Phoenix Lights, we're actually discussing two distinct events that happened in close proximity and time to one another. 
First, a triangular formation of light seen to pass over the state was observed and reported by multiple witnesses. After this, a second event was reported wherein a series of stationary lights were seen in the Phoenix area. Officially, the United States Air Force identified the second group of lights as flares, which they claimed were dropped by A-10 Warthog aircraft that were conducting training exercises at the Barry Goldwater Range in southwest Arizona. Witnesses claimed to have observed a huge Carpenter Square-shaped UFO containing five spherical lights, or possibly light-emitting engines. Fife Symington, the man you just watched in the interview, the governor at the time, was one of many witnesses to this incident. He would later go on to describe the object as otherworldly. The lights were reported to have reappeared in 2007 and 2008, but these events were quickly attributed to, respectively, military flares dropped by aircraft at Luke Air Force Base and flares attached to helium balloons released by a civilian. However, in 2007, then ex-Arizona Governor Fife Symington told the press, in the presence of 14 high-ranking military officials from several countries, that in 1997 he saw something that defied logic, that it wasn't the first time these events had been witnessed, and that it wouldn't be the last. However, he had a very different tune at the time of the actual events. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. Don't get him too close to me, please. You know. In the alien costume, the governor's chief of staff. Now this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> UFO enthusiasts were not amused, especially since the governor was believed to have seen nothing. Today, Symington says that it was his public duty not to alarm the residents of Arizona and that he was trying to infuse the situation with humor. Many speculate, however, that it's far more likely he was afraid of repercussions, like losing his job, had he publicly admitted to seeing a UFO. Regardless of his motives, he and many others now stand firmly behind their claims that what they witnessed that night defied logic, explanation, and any excuse the military has since offered up. There are so many details, so many witnesses, and so much intrigue surrounding the events that it's worth diving into a little further. After all, this wouldn't be the first, or last, time that the military has written off suspicious, well-documented, and highly reported celestial anomalies as weather balloons or flares. So, to begin our investigation into this phenomenon, let's look at the timeline. On March 13, 1997, Arizona residents were going about their lives as usual, completely unaware that they were about to witness something extraordinary. It began at around 7.55 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. That's when a resident of Henderson, Nevada, happened to look up from what he was doing and see something unusual out his window. Exiting his residence to further investigate, he discovered what he described as a V-shaped object roughly the size of a Boeing 747 aircraft with six lights on its leading edge. As the lights headed toward the southeast, he heard the sound of rushing wind and it was gone. Of course, we now know that those lights were headed to Arizona. It wasn't long before Prescott and Prescott Valley residents took notice. At approximately 8.17 Mountain Standard Time, callers began reporting the object. They said that it was definitely solid because it blocked out much of the starry sky as it passed overhead. John Kaiser was standing outside with his wife and sons in Prescott Valley when they noticed a cluster of lights to the west-northwest of their position. The lights formed a triangular pattern, but all of them appeared to be red, except the light at the nose of the object, which was distinctly white. The object, or objects, which had been observed for approximately two to three minutes with binoculars, then passed directly over the observers. They were then seen to bank to the right and disappeared into the night sky to the southeast of Prescott Valley. The altitude could not be determined. However, the object was fairly low and, as they reported, made no sound whatsoever. The National UFO Reporting Center received the following report from the Prescott area, quote, while doing astrophotography, 
I observed five yellow-white lights in a V formation moving slowly from the northwest across the sky to the northeast, then turn almost due south and continue until out of sight. The point of the V was in the direction of movement. The first three lights were in a fairly tight V, while two of the lights were further back along the lines of the V's legs. During the northwest to northeast transition, one of the trailing lights moved up and joined the three and then dropped back to the trailing position. I estimate the three light V to cover about 0.5 degrees of sky and the whole group of five lights to cover about one degree. The next place to report these lights was a town of Dewey, about 10 miles or 16 kilometers east of Prescott, Arizona. Six people saw a large cluster of lights while driving northbound on Highway 69. Then, of course, was the first sighting from Phoenix. Tim Lay and his wife Bobby, his son Hal, and his grandson Damian Turnage first saw the lights when they were above Prescott Valley, about 65 miles or 100 kilometers away from them. At first, the lights appeared to them as five separate and distinct lights in an arc shape, as if they were on top of a balloon, but they soon realized that the lights appeared to be moving toward them. Over the next 10 or so minutes, the lights appeared to come closer, the distance between the lights increased, and they took on the shape of an upside-down V. Eventually, when the lights appeared to be a couple of miles away, the witnesses could make out a shape that looked like a 60-degree carpenter square, with the five lights set into it, with one at the front and two on each side. Soon, the object with the embedded lights appeared to be coming right down the street where they lived, about 100 to 150 feet, or 30 to 45 meters above them, traveling so slowly that it appeared to hover, they also remarked that it was completely silent. The object then seemed to pass over their heads and went through a V opening in the peaks of the mountain range towards Squaw Peak Mountain, where then Governor would have witnessed it. From there, it went toward the direction of Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. Witnesses in Glendale, a suburb northwest of Phoenix, saw the object pass overhead at an altitude high enough to become obscured by the thin clouds. This was at approximately 8.30 to 8.45 Mountain Standard Time. When the triangular formation entered the Phoenix area, Bill Greiner, a cement driver hauling a load down a mountain north of Phoenix, described the second group of lights. He said, I'll never be the same. Before this, if anybody had told me they saw a UFO, I would have said yeah, and I believe in the Tooth Fairy. But now, I've got a whole new view. And I may be just a dumb truck driver, but I've seen something that don't belong here. Griner stated that the lights hovered over the area for more than two hours. After leaving Phoenix, the lights continued onward. A report came from a young man in the Kingman area who stopped his car at a payphone to report the incident. The young man, who was en route to Los Angeles, called from a phone booth to report having seen a large and bizarre cluster of stars moving slowly in the northern sky. There is some controversy as to how best to classify the reports on the night in question. Some are of the opinion that the differing nature of the eyewitness reports indicates that several unidentified objects were in the area, each of which was its own separate event. This is largely dismissed by skeptics as an over-extrapolation from the kind of deviation common in necessarily subjective eyewitness accounts. The media and most skeptical investigators have largely preferred to split the sightings into two distinct classes, a first and second event for which two separate explanations are offered. As for the first event, the V, which appeared over northern Arizona and gradually traveled south over nearly the entire length of the state, eventually passing south of Tucson, was the apparently wedge-shaped object reported by then-Governor Symington and many others. The event started at about 8.15 Mountain Standard Time over the Prescott area and was seen south of Tucson by 8.45 Mountain Standard Time. 
Proponents of two separate events propose that the first event still has no provable explanation, but that some evidence exists that the lights were in fact airplanes. According to an article by reporter Janet Gonzalez that appeared in the Phoenix New Times, videotape of the V-shape shows the lights moving as separate entities, not as a single object. A phenomenon known as illusory contours can cause the human eye to see unconnected lines or dots as forming a single shape. Mitch Stanley, an amateur astronomer, observed high-altitude lights flying in formation using a Dobsonian telescope, giving 43 times magnification. After observing the lights, he told his mother, who was present at the time, that the lights were aircraft. According to Stanley, the lights were quite clearly individual airplanes. A companion who was with him recalled asking Stanley at the time what the lights were, and he said, planes. When Stanley first gave an account of his observation at the Discovery Channel Town Hall meeting with all the witnesses there, he was shouted down in his assertion that what he saw was what other witnesses saw. Obviously, Stanley was seeing the Maryland National Guard jets flying in formation on their way to drop high-altitude flares at the Barry M. Goldwater bombing range south of Phoenix. His account as to the nature of the lights that moved in formation that night is contradicted by some Phoenix residents without high-powered telescopes, however, and no military or civilian aircraft formations were known to have been flying in the area at that time. Of course, the Maryland National Guard jets were not known about at that time because their mission was a classified military mission. Additionally, Prescott includes the western campus of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, where flight training occurs with a large fleet of light aircraft. An additional whispered theory on campus is that the aircraft in formation were Embry-Riddle aircraft flying in formation with transponders and lights off as a prank. It is treated as an open secret as such behavior is a severe violation of FAA and Embry-Riddle rules. The second event was the set of nine lights appearing to hover over the city of Phoenix at around 10 p.m. The second event has been more thoroughly covered by the media, due in part to the numerous video images taken of the lights. This was also observed by numerous people who may have thought they were seeing the same lights as those reported earlier. The U.S. Air Force explained the second event as slow-falling, long-burning illumination flares dropped by a flight of four A-10 Warthog aircraft on a training exercise at the Barry Goldwater Range. According to this explanation, the flares would have been visible in Phoenix and would have appeared to hover due to rising heat from the burning flares creating a balloon effect on their parachutes, which slowed the descent. The lights then appeared to wink out as they fell behind the Sierra Estrella mountain range to the southwest of Phoenix. A Maryland Air National Guard pilot, Lt. Col. Ed Jones, responding to a March 2007 media query, confirmed that he had flown one of the aircraft in the formation that dropped flares on the night in question. The squadron to which he belonged was, in fact, at davis Monthan Air Force Base, Arizona, on a training exercise at the time, and flew training sorties to the Barry Goldwater Range on the night in question according to the Maryland Air National Guard. A history of the Maryland Air National Guard, published in 2000, asserted that the squadron, the 104th Fighter Squadron, was responsible for the incident. The first reports that members of the Maryland Air National Guard were responsible for the incident were published in the Arizona Republic newspaper in July of 1997. Military flares such as these can be seen from hundreds of miles away, given ideal environmental conditions. Later comparisons with known military flare drops were reported on local television stations, showing similarities between the known military flare drops and the Phoenix lights. An analysis of the luminosity of the type of flare used, which would have been dropped by the A-10 aircraft at the time, determined that the luminosity of such flares at a range of approximately 50 to 70 miles would fall well within the range of the lights viewed from Phoenix.
The public response was mixed. At first, there was minimal news coverage at the time of the incident. In Phoenix, a small number of local news outlets noted the event, but it received little attention beyond that. But on June 18th of 1997, USA Today ran a front page story that brought national attention to the case. This was followed by news coverage on the ABC and NBC television networks. The case quickly caught the popular imagination and has since become a staple of UFO-related documentary television, including specials produced by the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, and more recently, BuzzFeed Unsolved. Still, most people who were there and witnessed the events reject all of the military explanations Though he may have made light of the situation at first, then-Governor Fife Symington has actually been one of the strongest voices in support of the fact that what they saw that night was, in fact, a UFO. In March 2007, Symington said that he had witnessed one of the crafts of unknown origin, quote-unquote, during the 1997 event, although he did not go public with the information. In an interview with the Daily Courier in Prescott, Arizona, Symington said, quote, I'm a pilot, and I know just about every machine that flies. It was bigger than anything I've ever seen. It remains a great mystery. Other people saw it. Responsible people. I don't know why people would ridicule it, close quote. Symington had earlier said, quote, It was enormous and inexplicable. Who knows where it came from? A lot of people saw it, and I saw it too. It was dramatic, and it couldn't have been flares because it was too symmetrical. It had a geometric outline and a constant shape." Close quote. Symington also noted that he requested information from the commander of Luke Air Force Base, the general of the National Guard, and the head of the Department of Public Safety, but none of the officials he contacted had an answer for what had happened and were also perplexed. Later, he responded to an Air Force explanation that the lights were flares by saying, quote, As a pilot and a former Air Force officer, I can definitively say that this craft did not resemble any man-made object I have ever seen, and it was certainly not high-altitude flares, because flares don't fly in formation, close quote. In an episode of the television show UFO Hunters called The Arizona Lights, Symington said that he contacted the military when it happened, asking what the lights were. Their response? No comment. He pointed out that he was the governor of Arizona at the time when he made the request, not just some ordinary civilian. But still, the official response was no comment. Frances Barwood, the 1997 Phoenix City Councilwoman who launched an investigation into the event, said that of the over 700 witnesses she interviewed, quote, the government never interviewed even one. To this day, nobody knows for sure what caused the light anomalies over Arizona. The lights reappeared again in 2007 and 2008 and multiple accounts of strange lights over the same area continue to be reported today. Most reports fly under the radar, or are deliberately swept aside, as are most reports of possible UFO sightings. But Phoenix has embraced the legacy of the Arizona lights. Each and every year on the anniversary, news coverage reminds residents of the day in 1997 when possible UFOs visited them. An annual festival is held as well, and a documentary was made several years ago by one of the witnesses. It's likely that we'll never find sufficient answers to what happened that night, but prominent fixtures of Phoenix society, from lawyers and police officers to government officials, all say they know what they saw and that official explanations fall short. So, did UFOs visit Arizona that night? Did the government know? And if so, are they still engaging in a cover-up to this day? We may never know, but the witnesses who lived through that night say they know what they saw, and they will never, ever forget. That's it for this first episode of Phenomena Friday. I'll see you next week for another one.